here live inside the Cube in New York City for a special Cube uh, presentation of HP Moonshot, their big announcement, changing the landscape of servers, servers and data centers. Here at a major inflection point in the industry, transformation to a new modern era of computing applications, et cetera. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. Doug Foster is here from Purdue University. Doug is the Executive Director of Research Computing and Enterprise Apps at Purdue. Doug, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much. So you are a, a CIO, you've done a number of stints as a CIO. Yes, um, I have. Uh, you're you're focused on on, on apps. Got a particular expertise in SAP apps. Yes. Um, and you're here today talking about infrastructure. Which yes. Is kind of interesting. So yes. <laughs> to a CIO and an apps guy, wh why do you even care about infrastructure? What do you what do you want out of your infrastructure? Well, uh, so I think the the important component here uh, is really about this uh, sort of sea change, step change in um, what's happening with infrastructure. The the movement that that Moonshot uh, brings for us. Uh, is pretty substantial. Our, the curve that we've been on uh, with x86, uh, our x86 platform, is um, has not really been moving at the rate we needed to move. The the amount of research as a uh, in a research institution, the amount of research that's coming at us, and the need for greater and greater uh, computational capacity, we just can't keep up. Uh, something needs to change. The shift needs to happen. Uh, we think that this platform gives us flexibility to aim specific research uh, problems at configured hardware specialized for that problem. So that, that's what's really interesting uh, for us in this. Yeah, so it's interesting because um, th there's a sort of one school of thought. So you, I presume you use x86 blades today. And, yes. And, and yep. so there's one school of thought that says, well, I can virtualize those blades and right. I can... I could manage, you know, one box and whatever X number of virtual machines, and and that would be easier than configuring, you know, separate servers for the specific workloads. Correct. Um, but you have somewhat of a different angle on that. Yeah, uh, the, the view for us is that um, obviously within uh, particular workloads, we're looking for an optimization of support and uh, maintenance and those kinds of things like everybody else is. But the key for us is to optimize individual workloads. We as a research institution just happen to have a broader set of those uh, sorts of problems. Um, so when we're, uh, sort of customizing these environments against those problems, um, that for us will significantly reduce the requirements for uh, specific hardware against it. Um, uh, so I guess you could say in the long run, we see that as it will actually simplify our maintenance if we can reduce it significantly enough. And we, we're hearing very big numbers, 80% uh, uh, reduction in uh, you know, power requirements and those kinds of things. That's, that's a very big deal for us. As a, as a academic and research area, are you interested in the moonshot from like some contributing technology or to with with HP in a partnership, or are you more um, a customer saying, "Hey, we need the latest and greatest," or both? Or it's, what's the relationship? It's well, we have a great relationship with HP. It goes back ten years or more. Um, currently, uh, use their servers in uh, our uh, research clusters. We're we're probably doing a little bit of both. Um, one piece of this is. Um, looking for HP to help us uh, deliver solutions that aim at these specific research problems. Another part of this is we're um, uh, standing up a, what we're calling the HP Discovery Lab at Purdue. Uh, we will employ students. Um, Purdue produces a very large number of high quality uh, engineering uh, students. Um, and we're going to employ them in a, in a co-locate them with some HP resources to work on uh, Moonshot. And We'll work on a variety of problems there. Uh, some will be directly related to uh, our research needs. So we think we will be helping each other. HP will bring us uh, some solutions to some problems we have, and we think we can help them design solutions for it. A lot of it, we, just, we were just in Boston for a thing with SAP um, on, uh, on Friday at the Hack Reduce Center, and where they, all the entrepreneurs are there. And, uh, um, an MIT guy got up there and was giving this big talk about big data. Mm -hmm. oh and yeah. then someone asked the question, what about this uh, network configuration? And he's like, I, I just get the best technology. I don't really have to worry about those problems. But academics need, the researchers need all the best tech because yes. they are working on some of the hardest problems. Can you talk about some of the things that you guys are doing that where you're pushing the envelope on the tech side where, and where this fits in vis-a-vis -vis the old architecture of x86 and or um, scale up? 
the, uh, hardware? Yeah, I, I think the, there are a number of things that we're, uh, we have a variety of, of uh, problems being uh, worked on in our uh, research computing environment. We go, we run the gambit. We have very large computational intensive uh, sorts of problems like uh, predicting weather, um, uh, those kinds of things, predicting earthquakes, uh, those sorts of things. We um, also suspect that uh, with this uh, first configuration of uh, uh, Moonshot that there's an application for uh, what we term uh, Monte Carlo uh, simulations. They're not as intensive individually, but there's millions of them. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're in lots of spaces. We're starting to even get into uh, some of the humanities uh, with computational science, which is, is intriguing, interesting for us. So lots of different places. And our, our researchers um, are, are continuing to push the limits of what uh, this, uh, this technology can do. So this, I think, will be a very welcome um, uh, addition to their portfolio. Now, I'm told you guys are um, putting forth some kind of discovery lab yes. uh, at yep. the university. Tell us more about what that is. So the discovery lab will be, um, uh, it's a, we've carved out some prime real estate on a, on a, a campus real estate is of uh, a very high premium. We've carved out some um, uh, right in the center of our campus, uh, a research lab basically where HP employees and uh, students will work together uh, to solve some of these problems and look at new uses for the technology, how it might um, uh, solve some of our research problems, but I think more generally HP could bring some uh, more general business problems to the table and, and ask students to help design solutions to solve those problems. I wonder if we could switch gears a little bit and talk about your experience as a, as a CIO. Sure. And, um, we're noticing, uh, and we're not the only guys to cover this, but we've been covering it pretty extensively, that the innovation in this industry is obviously coming from consumerization, and, mm -hmm. and, and you see the activity within you know, the, the web giants and what many people call the hyperscale side right. as um, trickling in to the traditional enterprise. But Surely. there's complexities within the traditional enterprise that make that hard. So right. I wonder what you could you share with us your take on on that trend in innovation and you know generally and then specifically how that consumerization and hyperscale piece will ultimately affect the traditional enterprise. So, a that's uh, a pretty difficult uh, question to answer. The how this is going to go from my perspective right now is in a number of different ways. One place that I can see this going is that a lot more. Um, organizations are going to start participating in cloud-based kind of computing and say we've just gotten to a level of scale and simplification that uh, says I don't need to, I can't do this anymore. I can't be competitive with these large uh, scale um, uh, organizations. So that's one trend that I see happening. I think a lot more people could start to get on board with um, do I really need to run infrastructure? Um, the other thing that I think is happening here is because of the kind of sea change that we see um, in this technology, I think there will be, um, we, we can't even predict the ways that people are going to uh, figure out how to use this. There still are um, great opportunities. It looks like the day, you know, my, my favorite example is the day I got uh, a smartphone. I wasn't exactly sure why I needed it or what I was going to do with it. Um, and today, you couldn't rip it out of my. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so I think this this technology um, feels very similar to me. It feels like we're at the beginning of something, um, and where it could go. Um, that's why we're so excited about the Discovery Lab because we want to help steer some of that and be involved in where this technology goes. So you have a, again, very interesting background. And one of your roles was to kind of, I, I call it, uh, to translate wallet into geek and yeah. geek into wallet. <laughs> right. uh, that liaison between IT and the business. Absolutely. Um, and we've, we've seen the need for that uh, for obvious reasons because IT is so complex. Right. And business always right. screws it up when they try to manage their own <laughs> IT. Is that with cloud and, and this whole consumerization trend, the smartphone, is that changing or, or is IT actually getting more complex? Do you see that shadow IT function which is driving a lot of, for instance, big data uh, initiatives and, and maybe even some cloud initiatives, you know, the old meme about marketing is going to have more money to spend than the CIO. Right. Um, 
do you see that traditional liaison role as, as changing or morphing, and how so? Absolutely. Well, absolutely. One is I, one of the most important roles, uh, in my view, in, in IT today is uh, this role of bridging that gap. Um, a lot of uh, traditional uh, CEOs will not understand the implications of what just happened, um, and they won't know why they care about this. That's that will be the that's the question that I'm used to getting from CEOs: is why do I care about this? And that that translation um, is critically important if people are going to make the right strategic investments in in technology. They have to understand, in business terms, in their language. Why does this matter to you? And uh, I think the big things here, if I was uh, talking to a CEO, would be about this 80%, 70% reductions in cost and power consumption and those kinds of things. They're the kinds of things that I think business people can get their heads around. Um, what does that mean from the perspective of how technology is actually deployed in businesses? Again, in my view, a lot of CEOs don't really care. Uh, as, they're long just as, they're out, as long as they have the apps they need. Does it run? Do I get what I need? Is it uh, affordable? So let's talk about that because we were talking about that earlier and I think just on the power and cooling thing alone, this is just a revolution because it's just amazing because a lot of those conversations right now in IT, uh, as a CIO you know, is, is a, has been around OpEx, but we've been at over a decade of kind of shrinking and cutting to the bone of IT right. and now you have a tsunami of a of a, of a landscape saying, hey, mobile works, SaaS works, we don't have infrastructure reserves, we don't have cloud, so the delivery is not there yet, it's right. getting there, yeah. but yet you have investments. So now, the pressure to invest in IT, combined with the, sh the, the space constraints, yes. with the option of cloud, right. and mobile for the delivery, or right. consumerization of IT, VDI, whatever it is, right. at the edge, you have the perfect storm for a transformation. So yes. given that, what are you? What are, what are CIOs talking about right now? Because obviously footprint's big, because they got to expand. So now they have a choice: do they expand data centers? Do they consolidate data centers? I mean, it, it must be it must be very complicated. Can you share some insight on what those, what that world is like right now in your in your mind? Yeah. So I I think for uh, I can give you I can give you two different answers, and they go in two completely different directions. Because a, a research university is a very different animal than your standard uh, corporate environment. From the research perspective, um, the strategic components of what we do are research and our IP. A lot of that we are very uncomfortable with putting out in, in the cloud. We're very concerned about um, that IP um, being exposed. Um, we're concerned about uh, all of the bandwidth problems associated with high performance computing over a distance, all, all of those sorts of things. When you look at the more uh, traditional corporate environment and a lot of what we would call our back office functions, I think it it's the discussion is really starting to boil down to these economics of how do we get the needed um, uh, services delivered the fastest and cheapest. And one, one of the components that I've been a um, very um, uh, interested in is this speed uh, component. And that's another reason why I like the moonshot technology. I like where it's going because I think a big part of tying up dollars in an in a, uh, organization is related to the time it takes to change, the time it takes to adapt. There's a market opportunity that shows up, but IT is too too big, too cumbersome, too slow to make that transformation. So I think the discussions that we've been having are about in these spaces where um, we are not as concerned about uh, our IP and those sorts of things. How can we get to a very agile, flexible, quickly configurable uh, sort of environment? And it all comes back to in on on the corporate side or on our back office side. It, it comes down to cost and time. They're they're the things that we just continue to drive to. So a lot of that cost gets consumed in uh, what Jeff Hammerbacher John calls the container, right? We yeah. spent all this money on the container. We don't have any money left over for software and algorithms and other processes around them. Right. Um, as the cost of the, you know, I'm genericizing the word yes. container, it could be storage, it could be servers, whatever. Mm -hmm. As the cost of that infrastructure comes down, do you see that that spend shifting toward those other areas that are going to drive business value? And will that actually get us out of this morass of, you know, do more with less, budget cuts, I mean, the, the CIO hell that they're in? Yes, ab I mean, absolutely. I can tell you from the Purdue perspective, um, we are committed to driving uh, costs, uh, overhead, 
um, out of the box, as you call it, and driving it into the things that drive our uh, university, research and teaching. Um, in the corporate environments, it's no different. I would suspect in, in former organizations that I've been part of, uh, marketing being usually a very important component uh, of those uh, organizations. It's driving it out of all of the back office sorts of functions and driving it into, uh, you know, sort of difference makers in the marketplace. So um, I think it's critical. And I think it's, I think there's, I think that's, there's an opportunity here to do more of that. Yeah, and ironically, I think that'll actually drive more demand for the infrastructure, but it's, it'll be easier to justify because it's a clear business value. Exactly. Yeah. So my final question as we wrap up here, it's been a great conversation because you kind of span both worlds. You kind of got the 20 mile stare on both the academic and research side as well as corporate, which is completely different animals, both can, you know, trying to be faster. Right. Um, what is your advice to uh, CIOs uh, on the corporate side? Um, the research side seems to be they have a lot more dough and they, get, you know, they, they can work with more budget, but you know, as the corporate guys have to invest now, Mm -hmm. The mindset's changed. A modern era is upon us, right. as you pointed out, some of the things you like about Moonshot and other things. What's your advice to CIOs out there on how to execute over the next five years? Uh, the, so I think the first piece here, if you look at any of the key shifts uh, in technology over time, there is a period of, um, I'll call it confusion. Uh, there's a period of just like I uh, referenced the cell phone or the smartphone discussion, what do I do with this? How does it apply to me? Um, so, so my advice would be in the short term is to get a real deep understanding of this technology, how it can apply, what kind of problems it can solve in your environment. And I, and I, I would venture a guess that the people that move the fastest here will be the winners. The people that are going to lag behind, not uh, you know, sort of not believe that they need a smartphone or that they, they need this technology uh, or that it has an implication for them, I think are going to be left uh, by the side. Excellent. All right, Doug, well, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and uh, sharing your perspectives with us. Like you said, John said, that dual personality perspectives and uh, <laughs> Thank you very appropriate much. for this announcement. And, uh, and keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest.